actually, I think I have to stop sharing my screen in order to <laughs> let people on as panelists. Let's see. Participants and these. Hello, thank you to everyone who's joining. I we're trying to figure out some fun Zoom issues. Let's see. Okay, Tanya should be rejoining. Yay. <laughs> Hi Tanya. Hi, is it technology? wonderful it's so much fun <laughs> here i'll message kathleen um, let me tell my husband i just started here for everyone else joining us thanks so much for coming and we will start um in a little bit i had to start the webinar a bit early to make sure all of the panelists could get in. We will commence at our regularly scheduled timing. Hello to folks who are joining. We'll get started at um, probably around like 6.33 to give some folks time to trickle in. Um, so if you're coming in now, feel free to sit back, relax, go get yourself some tea, some popcorn. That sounds yummy. I know. I said that and I was like, Oof. Now I want tea and popcorn. Hello to folks who are joining. Thanks so much for being here tonight. We're going to go ahead and get started in a couple minutes. Um, while we're waiting for folks to trickle in, if you want to pop in the chat um, your name, your location, um, and maybe someone who you're celebrating this International Women's Day. Yay, the whole crew is here now. <laughs> Hi, Kathleen. 
Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us and sitting through those technical difficulties. I'm glad it all worked out. Joining at the, the final hour. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it usually goes. <laughs> Always something. We're gonna go ahead and get started in about two minutes. We're just gonna give folks a little bit of time to trickle in. Um, and while we do that, um, if folks want to put in the chat just your name, where you're calling in from, and someone you're celebrating this International Women's Day. Everyone see my screen. Beautiful. Thanks everybody for joining. See more folks trickling in. We'll get started in just a minute. Aww. We love seeing all these messages of who we're all celebrating. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, as people are coming in, should I go ahead and kick us off here, Callie? yeah let's do it <laughs> wonderful well thank you all for joining and for sharing in the chat again if you're joining we're just sharing our name where we're calling in from and who we're celebrating this international women's day so please continue to share those um, as we go along and as you're inspired but i'd love to officially welcome you all thank you so much for coming my name is emily pellisier and i'm the executive director here at presidio graduate school I'm delighted to welcome you all to our International Women's Day panel. We're so grateful that you're sharing part of your evening with us to honor this important day, a day to celebrate the power and resilience of women and to acknowledge that our collective efforts are essential in shaping a better world for all. We're excited to hear from our panelists and engage in a meaningful dialogue with all of you. But before we kick off, I want to give you a brief introduction to Presidio Graduate School for those in the audience who may be less familiar with us. So here at Presidio, our core values are sustainability, social justice, and systems level transformation. And our mission is to educate change makers to build a flourishing future for all. For the past 20 plus years, we've produced over 2000 alumni who are driving meaningful change in businesses, nonprofits, and public service. Our degree programs, which include an MBA, an MPA, and a dual degree of MBA and MPA, as well as certificate programs, provide our students with the tools and knowledge needed to make tangible impact in their careers, whether they're working in corporate ESG, government, nonprofit leadership, social enterprises, or other fields. I'm proud to say that Presidio Graduate School is a women-run institution and that, it is a, and that it is at the forefront of progress towards a more sustainable, just, and equitable future for all. Our community is incredibly passionate and inspiring, and today, you'll have the opportunity to meet some of our community members, powerful women who are making a significant impact in their respective fields. And on that note, I will pass the mic over to our moderator for the night, who is one of our current dual MBA and MPA candidates, as well as an indispensable member of our team here at Presidio. So welcome Presidio student and program colleague. Well, thank you so much for that warm introduction, Emily. Um, and thank you all for joining today. Um, as you know, we're here today to honor International Women's Day, which is a day to celebrate the extraordinary achievements of women across the globe, while also shedding a light on the ongoing challenges that women encounter. Um, but I just wanna highlight that International Women's Day is far more than 
just a date on the calendar, and it really signifies a movement, a continuous call to action to accelerate gender parity, and really emphasizes that equality is not just an option, but it's essential to build a just, sustainable, and resilient future. So the theme of this year's 2024 International Women's Day is Inspire Inclusion. And before we dive into this discussion, I wanna lift up that true inclusion necessitates a lens of intersectionality. So intersectionality is a framework that acknowledges that an individual's experience um, and identity is shaped by multiple factors such as race, gender, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and ability. So when we talk about inspiring inclusion, we have to lift up the perspectives and experiences of all women, trans women, black women, brown women, indigenous women, gay women, disabled women, immigrant women, low income women, and all identities that have been historically erased, oppressed and marginalized, not just within society, but also within traditional feminist movements. Um, and I wanna lift up also that International Women's Day is not just about the inclusion of women, but all people who have been oppressed by patriarchal power structures, including non-binary, intersex and transgender people. And so at its core, International Women's Day is really a call to action for us to unite and dismantle all systems of oppression. And promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion is not just a moral imperative, but research also consistently supports that diversity and inclusion has profound benefits across all facets of society. So in the business sector, fostering diversity and inclusion results in enhanced employee morale, heightened productivity, superior creativity, and effective problem solving. It also contributes to higher revenue growth, bolstered employee retention, and a culture of innovation. In government, a more diverse and inclusive policy making process yields more sustainable and equitable development. It helps curbing overuse and degradation of resources while also fostering the creation of policies that are more attuned to the needs of communities that have been historically oppressed. And on a societal level, when economic power is more equitably and inclusively distributed, positive outcomes abound, including improved health, enhanced education, and stronger communities overall. So the big question remains, how do we enhance diversity, equity, and inclusion in a meaningful way? So today, our panel is dedicated to exploring the different avenues through which we can inspire inclusion in our workplaces, communities, um, and in society. So from fostering a culture of belonging to challenging systemic barriers, there are countless ways we can work together to create a more inclusive world where people and the planet can thrive for generations to come. So we will start with a panel discussion and then we'll open it up to Q&A at the end. So feel free to drop your uh, questions in the chat and we can monitor them throughout. And we are absolutely honored to be joined today by four incredible women from the Presidio community who are really forging the way toward a more sustainable and equitable future. So thank you all for being here with us tonight. And I would love for us to kick it off with some introductions. So if you could please introduce yourselves, your relationship to Presidio and the work that you currently do. I'll get us started. My name is Ariana Rabago. I am pronouns are she, her. I'm a dual degree MBA MPA at Presidio Graduate School currently. And I'm, I'm part-time in that program about two years in, a um, couple more couple more to go. And I'm part-time because I work full-time at the city of Ventura, where I create and manage environmental programs to help the city of Ventura community. My biggest baby is the food waste recycling program. It's the first in the city. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, I should, one more thing I should share at as well as being a student at Presidio, I'm also on the diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging governance pod, which is a, a, a newer, like a transitioning group, um, but we're working to bring those things to PGS and its student body. Thank you, Mariana. Which of our panelists wants to go next? It's 
Tanya, do you want to kick us off? Sure. I don't know if you can hear the noise in the background. I'm having a little bit of a technical issue. I have no idea what's going on. Um, but I will just quickly introduce myself and then go back on mute. Um, and hopefully I can figure this out. So my name is Tanya Bluford. Um, I am the founder of Bluford Consulting. So I have um, a consulting practice that helps organizations um, develop work environments, honestly, just plainly where everybody can thrive. Um, and so that looks differently at different organizations. Um, but really excited about the work that I've been able to do over the last few years and really thrilled with my connection to Presidio. Um, so I'm also an adjunct professor at Presidio and have been supporting the organization on its DEI journey as well. Amazing. Thanks so much. Also, we hear you fantastic. So you're good on that end. I can go. That's fine. Hi, everyone. My name is Chandra Alexander. Uh, I'm going to say this twice. I'm actually a C1 alumna. Uh, so yes, C1. Um, and I'm currently on the board of Presidio. So very, very proud to continue to support the, uh, the organization. Um, I am the CEO of Community Action Marin. We are Marin County's largest nonprofit social services agency, building an anti-poverty movement across the county. Great to be here. All right, that leaves me. Great to great to join the virtual stage with such wonderful women. Um, my name is Kathleen Wong. Um, I consider myself an entrepreneur at Adobe. Uh, Adobe is a multinational software company focused on creative and digital marketing marketing products. Uh, Acrobat, Photoshop, all the like. Um, so at Adobe, I apply my expertise in sustainable management and environmental economics to innovate within our business systems, particularly with a focus on social and environmental impact. Uh, I adopted my entrepreneurial mindset through my studies at Presidio after, grad after uh, doing my MBA part-time um, as a C22. I'm constantly reminded. <laughs> uh, so in my current role as the head of supplier diversity, a position I pioneered, I lead strategic initiatives to help develop a more inclusive and sustainable supply chain uh, by providing diverse oppor business opportunities to diverse businesses. And I help to optimize our process and technology uh, in along the way to make sure that those results are impactful. Um, yeah, and during my free time, I like to stay active. I engage in local nonprofits, like to bike and rock climb, and just kind of happy to be here with all these, uh, with, with the, the community again. It's been a bit. Well, thank you all so much for participating in today's panel. It's such an honor to have, you know, incredible women who are really at the forefront of making these important changes. And as we kind of uh, went over the theme for this year's International Women's Day is inspire inclusion. And with that, I'm curious, what does that phrase mean to you? Why is it important? And how are you taking that into your workplace, school, or other areas of your life? I don't mind starting. Um, so one of the things I entered into the chat um, in terms of who we're honoring for International Day, uh, International Women's Day, I included my grandmother because I think that she really was my entry into the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. Um, but really from a community standpoint, um, I spent a lot of time with her and my grandparents um, when I was growing up. My mom was a single mom at the time, so um, I spent a lot of time with them to, and they, you know, helped raise me for quite a while, but, you know, you know, she was from a small little town in, in Louisiana and, um, the community was really, really important. It was in the truest sense of the word, they all supported each other. They all helped each other. Um, as a matter of fact, 
when my grandmother was about three years old, her mom died. Um, she had 12 siblings and that was before there was foster care. So members of the community each adopted a different set or group of kids. Um, and they all stayed in the same community and were raised to, together. So my grandmother had um, a really strong connection with her siblings, despite not being raised with them. Um, but the that community and that bonding um, is something that I think is really critical to our society and critical to our workplaces. Um, I think when people feel like they, um, when they feel like they belong and when they feel like they are included, honestly, magic happens um, and nothing is impossible. And so I really credit her for instilling that and showing me that um, at a really early age. When I hear, thank you, Tanya, that was beautiful. When I, when I think of the word inclusion, I think of included, and for me, inclusion looks like everyone being represented, whether it's their voice or their needs at the table. Um, and I think you don't always have to have the most power in the room to to create uh, opportunity for inclusion. I think one of the examples of a way that I'm 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 not like the CEO or or whatever the highest position in my organization, but one of the ways that I try to make sure inclusion is prospering at the city of Ventura is we used to hire assistants um, through like the buddy or like word of mouth system where like my manager's friend would hear uh, like get introduced to someone's son or daughter. And, and a lot of the people that I work with are primarily white. And so it would be a lot of like your, your white neighbors, your white friends coming to work with us. And I really strongly advocated for us um having a more formal interview process, even for, you know, for all types of different positions, um, including our assistants. And I can proudly say that we've hired three women of color um, due to just changing that little little structure, some someplace that I actually did have a voice and could um, influence. So I think it doesn't matter, you know, the, the size of your position, big or small, or wherever you are, you have the opportunity to Im implement inclusion or inspire inclusion. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, no, that the theme really resonates with me on a profound level. And thank you for sharing that story, Ariana. I think it's important to show like the little wins. You don't have to be CEO um, or a big shot leader. Um, to me, this phrase really encapsulates an imperative to cultivate the environment that not only acknowledges diversity, but actively seeks to uplift and integrate each voice, regardless of gender or background. That's exactly what you did. So that's really cool. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a vital theme. It provide inclusion really does bring in some of those, the richness of perspectives, ideas, experiences, and helps us be more innovative and equitable. Um, so I think when I'm taking this to the workplace, um, I'm committed to embodying that spirit of inclusion through the design of my program. At Presidio, we learned about systems thinking, and when it comes to ensuring that diverse businesses are included, often it's the system that we put in place that sets those businesses at a disadvantage. For example, a high-profile business leaders likely have greater access to our CEO, our senior leaders, just by way of their network, they're golfing with them or something like that. So, you know, my work allows for consideration of these businesses to have a seat at the table and an opportunity to compete. Um, and even then, like in my personal life and professional and kind of the personal realm, um, I extend this commitment to inclusion uh, through some of my volunteer work. Uh, in the climbing gym, I I uh, worked with some with girls from underserved communities as a mentor, and it was a lot of fun to see these preteens develop confidence in their movement on the wall and kind of have access to a sport that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. So I'd say that journey is 
of inspiring inclusion is not only a professional responsibility for me, but a personal mission to foster uh, that world for everyone. You all are a tough act to follow. Um, you know, when, when you were talking, I was thinking about the power of listening and the power of deep listening, because we all come with a story. And Tanya started off with, thank you for bringing in your grandmother and your family and that story. And it also made me think of, you know, often we act really, really kindly to one another in crisis, right? Sometimes we're kicked into gear to recognize our universal humanness when there's a crisis. And I think inclusion is, is a strong invitation to say, really the crisis is every day if we don't bring the voices and the stories of our community, our neighborhood, our front yard, our backyard into dialogue. And so I start in my professional life in particular with an invitation, uh, but coupling that with active engagement, proactive sort of stepping out into community to say, I'm here to listen, I'm here to hear, I'm here to um, create an opportunity for deeper understanding. I want to find myself in another and I want them to find themselves in me. And if we're listening and we're listening for that deeper understanding and we're connecting through story and we're finding ourselves connected in community, I think powerful change can happen. So it can look like different hiring practices that are very intentional about removing barriers, uh, lowering hurdles or eliminating hurdles for people to get access to opportunities, right? Because it's not just that the opportunities exist. It's like, Ariane, you were saying, you know, you're creating an opportunity or the opportunity is there, but now you're giving access to women of color or you're giving access to people of color that didn't exist because, because of the policy or structure, unspoken or spoken, what have you. So, you know, I think that we have opportunities to change how those things work in our workplaces because we're paying attention, because we're listening, because we're asking those questions, we're learning and um, hearing people's stories and showing up with a different awareness and a different commitment. And then through that, making simple changes that can change a life, right? What if when we're putting out those job descriptions, and I know many of us are doing this, we're taking off the BA required and we're saying something like, preferred or comparable experience, right? Because we want to bring people who've not been given access to opportunity to the table to hear their stories, to say, you know what, we can work together because I value you and what you bring in and through your experience. And that's creating new stories, new ways of being in relationship with one another that are absolutely transformative. Wow, thank you all so much for sharing those beautiful and super powerful answers. I already feel inspired. Um, and I know that all of you have so much expertise in your respective fields, and there's so much to learn from uh, each one of you. And so I kind of want to turn toward some personal questions. Um, starting with you, Tanya, you have 20 plus years of working with both uh, small organizations and national organizations in the DEI and leadership development process. Um, and there's recent research showing that a lot of corporate DEI programs have been ineffective, which is sort of bringing public scrutiny to DEI programs. And so I'm curious from your expertise, how do we ensure that DEI efforts aren't just performative, but actually lead to substantial and lasting change? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. You know, um, there was a recent article that came out in Forbes, um, and that might be the article that you're referencing. But I thought it was really interesting. Like a lot of times when people talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion work, they refer to it as a program. And I think when you speak about it as a program, then that enough said. It's not a program. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion work is something that should be integrated. And if it's not integrated, well, then of course it's, it's not going to work. Um, and I even question what work means. Um, so what are, what, what does work look like? You know, it, are there goals that organizations are setting? 
Um, you know, uh, I love that um, Kathleen talked about the work that she's doing at Adobe being strategic. And that's really what diversity, equity, and inclusion needs to be about. It needs to be strategic and not focused on it being a program. Also, a lot of times organizations focus on the D in DEI, the diversity component, and they totally ignore the equity and inclusion. And so um, one organization that I worked for, they invested heavily in the diversity, um, building you know, that magical pipeline. But what they ignored was the lack of retention and the high attrition of staff of color. And so, you know, I think, again, what they say that their efforts didn't work, probably, but, you know, for in diversity, equity, and inclusion to be effective, it all needs to exist together. Um, it's not going to work if you focus on diversity only. It's not going to work if you ignore um, the inclusivity and the equity component. Um, they all really need to be um, hand in hand. And when they're not, um, then I think that's when they become not effective. I also think that um, with a lot of efforts, there's no accountability. Um, so a CEO <clears throat> might say, we want this, this, and this to happen. But when no one's held accountable for those results, well, um, it's kind of no surprise that maybe they don't get the results that they want. And I often see that as being a big problem in DEI efforts is there's lack of accountability and a lack of resources, honestly. Um, you know, for diversity, equity, and inclusion just to lie in the human resource area, human resources departments of a lot of organizations, that's not very effective. And in a lot of organizations are relying on, you know, staff volunteers, right, to lead um, portions of their work, whether that's affinity groups, employee resource groups. Um, and, you know, that is not equitable, um, nor is it strategic. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons why efforts fail, um, but I think organizations will do a better service to themselves if they look inward and see what they are doing or not doing that could be contributing to their lack of success. I'll stop now because I could go on for days. But... No, this is wonderful. I was actually curious if you could share with us an example of a particular uh, successful DEI strategy that you've been involved in and what made it successful. Yeah, um, well, I, so I also think strategies are ongoing. Um, and so as a consultant, I'm not always brought in um, for the whole piece of a strategy, maybe I start start with a strategy, start a strategy for an organization, and they continue. But one of the things I'm working with um, uh, a client um, now, and a lot of organizations want to start their diversity work with a training, and I really advocate against doing that for so many different reasons. Um, and so this particular organization did not start with the training, but once they did start implementing training, you know, a lot of times organizations do a one and done training. Oh, well, we've trained our staff on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, actually what they've done is they have provided one training on diversity, equity, and inclusion for the staff that are there. But next month when they bring in 10 new staff, those staff didn't get it. And also it goes back to accountability. What did they do with the training? And I feel like training is a tool to accomplish other goals. It's not an end all be all by itself. And so not only did this organization not start with training, but once they started implementing their training, their training was connected to a larger organizational goal around creating a specific culture within their organization. Um, and once they did that uh, a training for staff, they now have embedded components of that training within their new hire orientation. So that as new staff come on board, 
everybody re has the same information about the organizational culture that the organization is aspiring to create and they understand what their role as individual um, staff members is in, um, in making that culture come to life and, and what they can do in their role to make sure that people feel welcomed and feel included. And I think that's the pro, I mean, that I think that is, um, you know, I, I think that's an effective way to use training as opposed to, oh, we got to train everybody and they do trainings and then that's all you hear of it. Um, and I don't think that's effective at all. So I think that the way this organization did it was really helpful. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing those actionable insights. Um, and now I want to turn to you, Chandra. You have such a wealth of experience uh, that spans not only women's rights advocacy, but also a comprehensive approach to inclusion, considering various factors such as race, social status, uh, economics within both community based initiatives and global movements. Um, and so given your background, I'm curious to learn what do you perceive as the most pressing challenges and opportunities in advancing women's rights, inclusion and human rights overall on a global scale? Yeah, yeah, just give me a, a small question. <laughs> yeah, easy um, peasy, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, look, I, I think there's so many ways that we can um, we can look at what the challenges are. I, I think a big challenge and why we're having this conversation tonight is that so many um, so many spaces are are divisive, and so many spaces are not connected, and so many spaces. Uh, and and people continue to move to extremes and the polarization is getting worse and uh, all of the increases in inequities across all of the different uh, indicators of well-being uh, that there are, um, you know, it's, it's saddening and sickening all at the same time, right? The real challenges that we have in our country, in our in Marin County, locally, in the Bay Area, uh, and certainly in the world when it comes to women's human rights, just as one example. Um, one of the opportunities that we have though is, you know, as many of us have said, to create spaces that, um, well, I mean, we start with the basics, right? How do you get the basics of, uh, physical safety and psychological safety. You have to be willing to enter into that space to say, I want to, I yearn to connect with another to seek a better outcome than win-lose. Because the framing is so often there are winners or losers. You talked about patriarchy, right, Callie? You know, capitalist patriarchy, et cetera, et cetera. It's all about winners and losers. And so the shift around DEIBJ work, the shift around um, uh, inclusivity is, is to specifically create uh, a yearning for connection that people can say yes to, that says it's gonna be win, win, win. It's gonna be a way forward that actually, and maybe surprisingly for many of us who are used to the black and white, the yes, the no, the win, the lose, is it actually doesn't involve compromise because we're thinking about that and we we talk a lot about you know the zero sum game or the only so many pieces of the pie we got to stop that narrative we've got to shift the conversation to if i'm getting stronger in my greatness there's actually more good stuff to go around and so how do we do that so it's a framing uh it's an intentionality and the opportunities co to connect in spaces, and I'll be really specific about four, where we are as individual actors showing up, and then where we are as institutional actors showing up, because we all inhabit many different spaces and places. Then there are the spaces and places where we are as a collective. So for example, civic engagement and choosing to vote or choosing to lift up your voice or what have you. And it's across formal and informal sectors that we're able to then say, you know what, my contribution is meaningful. And that's how we build movements for change, to shift how people think, to tell a different story, to connect in our humanity. And I think many of us 
are familiar with the phrase targeted universalism, which says, look, we can talk about our shared humanness, but if we do it at the expense of those who are currently marginalized, we're actually not having the same conversation. So we have to be aware of difference, appreciative of difference, willing and open to uh, you know, step into the yearning for connection around a shared humanness, but do it recognizing the uniqueness of who we are as people, different backgrounds, all the things that you mentioned that are about the awareness of intersectionality. So we have the power in and through the spaces we choose to inhabit to create larger transformations. Um, but it does take the yearning, the connection, and the willingness to create the space for those conversations and connections to happen in the first place. Thank you so much for that. I'm kind of curious as a follow-up to that, um, in your role as CEO of Community Action Marin, how do you ensure that diverse voices are included in the decision-making process, as, uh, particularly when it comes to community action initiatives? and how can those strategies sort of be um, scaled to like a broader global impact? Yeah, I mean, I, I think starting with one example I can share. So I walked into my organization in 2018, 75% uh, of my over 200 staff are frontline. They're essential workers, they're out in community, they're engaging with uh, people of low income. And many of the frontline staff that we, we have, uh, and this is across all social service organizations, we know that many of them are people living um, uh, with lower, extremely low incomes themselves, just because of the nature of, for example, let's take childcare workers, people in early education, traditionally women and predominantly women of color, well, our system underpays them because the work of caring generally isn't reflected in the economy in ways that value women's work, all the things that we know. So what I did was I said, I need to ensure that the executive leadership of the organization is constantly listening and iterating based on the input and feedback of my frontline staff. So we created a staff council. And so the staff council works to provide input against employee surveys, against some of the traditional work environment things you do to ostensibly listen to employee voice, but then we sit down at a table together and we have conversations about what we're hearing. We go over data together and it's a way to be transparent. It's a way to learn together and it's a way to iterate, to improve. So is that scalable? Absolutely. Because that kind of listening disposition can happen across many different spaces and places um, with a commitment to sharing information, sharing data, and building community capacity. So I'll leave it at that, but that's an example. Thank you so much. I just love learning from all of your expertise. Um, and speaking of, I wanna turn to you, Ariana. Um, you've mentioned that you're really passionate about fostering leadership among BIPOC women in environmental solutions. And I was hoping that you could share with us why this is so important and as a environmental specialist yourself, what barriers do you see uh, that contribute to the disproportionately low representation of women of color in this field and how can those be overcome? Thank you, Kelly. And gosh, thank you, Chandra and Tanya. Those, those, I'm like, you got my wheels spinning. I have to transfer to thinking about this question. <laughs> uh, let's see. So you asked, um, you asked about the uh, why BIPOC representation is so important or why oh, I care so much. Um, I think that there are so many studies uh, showing that BIPOC are going to be and already are the most impacted by climate change. And I really believe that if we have more BIPOC and more women, BIPOC women at the table making decisions about environmental solutions, representing the needs of their own communities that we would have more equitable solutions. I have an, an example of that um, in my own personal experience. Uh, I live, I work in the city of Ventura and that, that city is nestled in Ventura County, which is about an hour north of LA, south of Santa Barbara. And in 2017, we were hit by the Thomas fire, which was one of the top 10 largest wildfires in California history. And I'll say that when I looked that stat up today, I. I recognize that eight of those top 10 fires have happened since 2017. 
which is a side note. Um, but at the time, you know, in such an emergency situation, public communications become extremely important, the accuracy of them, the urgency of them, timeliness, effectiveness, um, to ensure that the community is safe. And the people that were disseminating information about the Thomas fire back then were translating English to Spanish using a Google Translate service or some other service that did not accurately translate um, from English to Spanish. And one of the examples of of how um, of how sort of egregious that error was is that instead of the word brush fire, it was a word for like hairbrush. So you couldn't really you couldn't really make out what the concern was, and when it's such in that in that case when the issue is so immediate and so important that you have accurate information, an error like that could really result in um, the impact imp negative impacts to lives and homes. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, uh, you know, that could have been the impacts could have been to my family, my neighbors, my friends. Ventura County is almost fifty percent Latino population, including my family. A big, a big majority of that, I should say, not a majority, but a, a large subset, is Spanish speaking primarily in the home. So the importance of having that type of language in um, in accurate format is so important. Um, flash forward to twenty twenty. Uh, it's like the high, uh, the start of the pandemic, and I'm at the city of Ventura, and where it, it again becomes really important that public information is um, is disseminated in a, in a in a positive way, so that public health and safety are protected. Um, I get pulled into an emergency communications team, and uh, there was a decision ma being made about whether or not to whether or not to and how much to translate the communications from English to Spanish. And myself and my colleague Haley at the time advocated so strongly to have um, those that language translated professionally um, in hind, you know, in hindsight and looking back at issues that were that were created in the past. Um, and I'm proud to say that the city of Ventura now has a much more robust bilingual communication strategy. Um, and Let's see some of the other questions you asked. Um, the barriers to getting more more people at the table, because I really do believe that that when when we have people that re represent the communities for which we're fighting for, their needs are going to be more represented represented just because of the attunement. Um, I also feel like you know I get emotional telling that story, um, thinking about my family and. I think if anyone from my cohort is here, you have seen me cry <laughs> in class um, talking about how passionate I am about these issues and the outcomes. And I think that it's so important that we're emotionally connected. I think that's how we really create our strongest solutions is when we feel deeply connected to the issue. Um, and I think everybody, all genders have access to emotional connection, but I do think that's one place that feminine leadership really shines. Um, so it's, it's so for me, BIPOC women working in this space is so important. Um, and yeah, the barriers are so intersectional to getting us there. Um, and there's, I mean, think, I think Chandra spoke to some of them like really eloquently more so than I could at this time, but, um, there's some, the, some of the barriers that I've faced is, you know, sexism in the workplace, unfortunately, that still exists. Um, uh, you know, growing up low income and, and struggling more with getting edu the education to get a degree in environmental science and then work in the field. Um, I currently work with people that don't look like me. And so it's like the struggle, whether it's, it's not intentional, I, I don't agree. I don't believe that my coworkers are intentionally trying to make things harder, but it's maybe like the lack of noticing, um, which I think could, if we all just noticed a little bit more um, who's being heard, who's left out, um, we could really make a difference. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. And I see we're at 7.15. I do wanna leave a little bit of time for uh, audience Q&A. So, Kathleen, I'll turn to you, and then um, and then after that, we can open it up to the audience. 
Um, and Kathleen, I'm curious, as the head of supplier diversity at Adobe, which is a role that you really spearheaded, can you speak to why supplier diversity is so important and highlight some of the best practices that organizations can adopt to implement successful supplier diversity programs? Certainly. I think when people think about diversity in the corporate space, they often think about their workplace diversity. Just as when you think of uh, scope one, greenhouse gas emissions, and not scope three, emissions from suppliers, they're, they're both impactful and actually the supplier side is, is important. Um, you know, a lot of companies rely on that network of suppliers to deliver their goods or services. So it would be a miss to not extend that effort out to the supply chain. Um, you know, as the head of supplier diversity at Adobe, I, I firmly believe that it's not a buzzword. It's a strategic imperative that brings tangible benefits to our organization and the broader business community. Um, it's crucial for several reasons. When diverse businesses win, there's a ripple effect. Um, this program really got its tailwind in 2020 uh, when our employee network group, the Black Employee Network Group, uh, shined a light on all of the diversity and equity and inclusion initiatives at Adobe, including supplier diversity, which was a bit of a part-time job for me at that time. <laughs> and so, you know, working with diverse suppliers um, was shown to put money directly into the hands and the pockets of diverse and black owned entrepreneurs, just as when you go to support that women owned business in and their restaurant or their their crafts, um, you know, the, their, the little craft goods, uh, you're supporting their economic recovery and their growth. Um, I'll actually share an article on why racial and economic equality is a business issue in and of itself. Um, so we see that now and that studies show that having a more inclusive supply chain can generate returns to our innovation and our bottom line. And as we kind of look to extend the diversity programming effort, and I know you don't like the word programming, Tanya, but it's so ingrained in my mind right now <laughs> that like representation of our community is important to the company and our suppliers actually help us extend our customer reach. So when we develop those relationships with diverse businesses, you know, those businesses could be paying customers of ours too. Um, we increase that, that level of competition in our supply chain as well. And as a result, like perhaps we could get some better pricing. Um, you don't have to just work with Deloitte and Accenture, no, no bad will to them. Um, but oftentimes if you work with a, like a smaller business to, for your consulting service, um, you, you get a degree of personalization, they're a little more nimble, probably give you a better rate. So it, it makes business sense. Um, and, you know, our customers are asking for this, too. So it's kind of coming from all angles. And that, that was what kind of the messaging that was needed to really sell this program to our executives. I was like, it's not just doing good, but we also get some business benefits if we do it right um, and play a little more, uh, be a little more tactical with our messaging as well, because you want to be able to speak to um, not not just the do good part, um, but also the component that makes business sense. I love this. I feel like in the beginning, I started with this PowerPoint talking about, you know, just statistics on what research has found about the benefits of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And now we got to hear, you know, actual insights from people on the ground. So I love just having that come full circle and making those connections. And um, thank you all so much for your brilliant insights. I would love to open it up at this time for audience questions. And I see that there have been some popped in the chat. Um, Maureen, I believe that you have some questions that you asked. Um, would you like to come off mute and ask your questions? Oh, I see you have the setting. <laughs> Hi, it's nice seeing everyone. I 
had the great benefit of hearing Chandra and Tanya. And of course, I was with Ariana, so that's really nice to see everyone. And I want to say, Tanya, your story was really impactful to me because you're in a different state. And my mother's parents died at 16, and her dad was in the Navy, and she didn't have money for the funeral. So having that community you had, that she had around you, and a place that was considered less diverse than California, it's, all, it's very, really impactful. I just had a question for, like, more strategic question for anyone, you know, what you said, Ariana, I think we worked on in um, Stephanie's class, you don't even realize the question to ask. It, like, it's nice to say you want to listen, but in that book called Bias, you may not realize how the other person feels or how they feel. So they may not know how to listen or know how to ask. And so what kind of strategy would you have to put up something i mean it's it's sort of overbroad but maybe pick a smaller topic like you talked about spanish there's chinese people but i thought i have some deaf clients i know the visually impaired and some that are deaf also separately but i don't know how they would get the information about an emergency i thought about that um or somebody that's older that can't hear or somebody that's disabled but how would you post up there like that's a normal thinking person they just have this small disability but how would you put it up so they don't feel awkward or i, I don't know how do you start the discussion then mm, that's a that's an interesting question i think i think what i'm hearing is you ask like how do we make sure that all different types of people, whatever avenues they may need um, to get important information in, in my example, um, are having their needs met in the way that they need it. Um, but also, you know, a conversation. So if you started something around the water cooler, like, hey, you don't say, oh, I'm disabled, but I'm smart. <laughs> you don't talk like, you know, people don't bring that up like that, but sometimes people feel labeled. And so what's a small group you could start in your office where it might lead to something like, oh, hey, maybe we need, just like what you did, we need it really professionally translated. How do you get some kind of group started in a company? Like anybody can answer, but may not, I was picking on Ariana because she was talking about it, but I thought that's hard to start in some groups. You know, they don't understand there's a need. So it's, mm -hmm. Andre, you mentioned some techniques, but I didn't know if somebody had something. Yeah, your question is is so full. There's, a, I think, a lot to unpack there. Um, I guess the main part is is you want people to listen, and I think there's I'm one that people like to talk. And I'm probably like that. It's you can listen, but maybe I just don't know the question to hear. <laughs> I don't know what to. So I don't know how you're feeling. So I don't know the question to ask. Mm -hmm. you know, so, mm -hmm. I think listening. So I think that's why I like diverse friend groups and workspaces and, and naturally diverse places that you're working and living in are so important because you get to hear about the experiences of other people and bring in your empathy and bring, bring in your listening mm -hmm. to understand what people experience. So that way, whatever space you're in, you can notice, is that missing here? Is that person's voice representatives represented? So, you know, if I know that my friend is blind or deaf or has certain needs for receiving information and I work in communications, I can either, you know, pay someone to help me understand how their needs may be met. Um, I can take what they've shared with me as as my friend and bring that into the work that I do. I can ensure that those uh, people with, you know, those whatever the need or or uh, representation requirement is are are included in the workspace or are getting hired um, when they apply. Um, I think there's so many strategies to to getting there. Thank no, you very much. Yeah, they're great to listen to. It's interesting. I'm on mute. Well, thank you so much for that really, uh, yeah, like that very full question. I think that gives all of us a lot to chew on. Um, I see some other questions in the chat. Um, one of them was from Emily, and it's, I'd be curious to hear one significant um, change you all have personally noticed in the DEI space since your time at Presidio? 
And maybe Callie, we can actually reflect on that one for a minute, but I love the question Tracy just put in the chat as well, just in terms of like really practical questions while we have experts in the room. So I also defer to Tracy's question, certainly. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Tracy, um, here, I can give you the option to come online to talk if you would like, or I can just read it off, whatever you prefer. Oh, I can read it. That's fine. Thank you so much for having this uh, discussion. It's very important. And um, I actually have a background in HR, human resources. And I, all the time, women are just anyone, you know, they'll send me an email message. And I can't believe this is still happening. But my question is, what advice can you give to those who deal with microaggressions in the workplace? The workplace may advocate advocate for DEI, but are not practicing behind the scenes. What do you say to those who are in a toxic environment? And they're afraid to leave because, you know, maybe they can't get a job or they're afraid to start over again. What do you say to those people who are dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis, afraid to go to HR, afraid to, you know, file a claim, getting harassed, maybe even by their boss? What do you, what do you say to those people? Yeah, I don't mind jumping in. It's I'm so glad you were able to uh, join us today, Tracy. Um, yeah. I'm really thrilled. And I think your question is such an important one. Um, and it's one that has a real complicated, um, uh, I would say, well, I, it could have a very complicated response. I've certainly been in situations where I've been employed someplace where um, I felt the environment was toxic, but I also felt like I didn't have um, the freedom or the mobility to, to move. Um, and in that particular <clears throat> situation, it really took a physical toll on my health. Um, I ended up having to go on an extended medical leave. Um, I developed um, some heart issues. I became really pretty sick. I lost, you know, 20 pounds. It was a really bad situation. Um, and when in hindsight, when I think about those days, um, I, that was a price that probably was, sh should have been too high for me to have stayed in, in that particular environment. Um, as I've gotten older, uh, I think one of the benefits of of uh, aging, um, because there aren't a lot when you have the aches and pains and whatnot on a regular basis. But one of the the benefits I think of of um, being the age that I am is that um, I I am really clear what I will succumb to and put myself into and and what I won't. Um, and being in a toxic work environment um, is not healthy. Um, plus, it goes against a really personal value that I have and was reminded of during that time, which is in this, again, goes back to my grandmother. You know, my um, grandma always talked about, you know, letting your light shine. And my light was dimmed. It was put out. Um, it was dark during those days. Um, and I think it's really important if you're in that situation that you realize that you have the power to create whatever kind of future you want to have. Um, and it means it might be scary. Um, you have to venture into the unknown. Um, maybe you've been in that position for a really extended period of time and it's really scary to think about doing something different. Um, but don't give anyone else or any organization or company your power. You are control in control of you and you are the CEO of you. Um, and so what that means is to, you know, rely on your support network. And if you don't have one, create a support network. Doesn't mean that you can leave um, your place of employment right away but you can certainly start putting some plans in place um, so that you can uh, make a change. But I don't think it's, you know, 
we have the we have the power. Employees have the power. Um, and it's important as employees that we exercise that power in creating the kind of um, career and professional future that we want to have. Thank you. What a note to end on. I love right. that you are the CEO of you. <laughs> that resonated with that me one. too. Yeah. And a t-shirt. <laughs> The next round of uh, Presidio stickers. <laughs> well, thank you all so much for joining us today, all of the panelists, all of the uh, people who joined to listen and be inspired. Um, I certainly feel like I have so many tangible takeaways and just feel so incredibly empowered and inspired by all of the amazing work that um this group of women is doing so thank you and uh yeah with that thank you all for coming and if you are interested we have another event on april 4th which is a climate and justice education week panel um so co communications will be going out for that and thank you all so much for joining us happy women's month thank you thank you, thank you for organizing bye Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. I'll stay on for a little bit in case anyone has any questions, follow up questions. Let's see. All right. Yay. There we go. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Amazing job. I put it in the chat of like, Thank you, Callie. But next time I <laughs> over your agenda, and I have a minute where I say, yay. yay. Oh, man, thank <laughs> you. Yeah, it's definitely, I'm still getting used to the moderating. Um, oh, my gosh. Well, you know, it's like moderating, you know, and we can in future stuff split this up more. And when I have more capacity where you're like monitoring the chat, you're moderating and you're doing the tech like, oh, we should stop the recording. We'll have to oh, right. cut this out. But. <laughs>